You look at Elijah Muhammad, a misunderstood person. Yeah, misunderstood. Because again, sometimes we, we are so right-brained, we let our dislike or disapproval of certain of his behaviors overshadow our capacity to see what gifts he brought us as a people and to come to really understand what this man was about and the greatness of what he created in the nation of Islam. Yeah. Because we let a series of events get to us so much, we want to throw the baby out with the wash water. You see. But what was he doing? He recognized, too, that cultural identity, religious identity, were as political as they were psychological, were as economical as they were psychological, you see. And he recognized then that he had to also change the taste of black people and change their what? Interest as well. Their emotions and their what? Feelings as well. And a part of that change was projection of the white man is demon mythology, which was very functional and real. <laughs> but very functional. You see, I've told you a lot of people think, oh, well, that wasn't the truth. That wasn't the point. It wasn't the point. It amazes me now, you know, someone mentioned the Tuskegee experiments. These whites are going to tell all the truth now, now that they got to what? The world, what? Wrapped up. But in wrapping it up, they projected the what? The myth. Because the myth, the major function of the myth is to organize people, to organize a people's perception of themselves, to, to give them a sense of destiny and commonality to arrange their social relations in such a way so that they could achieve particular points and particular ends. And it's not that they didn't know that the Egyptians might have been African. It was in their literature. That's a lot of where we got it from, isn't it? <laughs> but at the point where a mythology of Africans as being uncultured served to organize them and create a unity among themselves and serve to create a set of relations that permitted them to make a conquest of the globe, they projected that mythology. And it was a powerful one. Now that they think they have it made, they say, well, yeah, you were Egyptians, weren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, we did give you TB down there. You know, what are you going to do about it? Oh, now we're becoming honest folk, you know. But what happened? No banks are changing hands. No means and ownership of production are changing hands. No real control of your destiny is changing hands. But you're multicultural now. We have greater understanding and truth. Mm -mm. It's got to go deeper than that. You got to do more than tell the truth. You're going to reparate yourself. We're going to take these reparations from you. You can admit we're Egyptians if you want to, but it's not the end of it. Mm -mm. No way. And we as black people can't fall for the okie doke. Oh, they say we're Egyptian. Ain't that wonderful? Oh, they're saying that we're this and we're that. Isn't that nice? Uh-uh. Now, you see, because now we're moving toward multiculturalism, right? Suddenly we're going to see them all as nice and sweet and wonderful. But what? The actual power relations that run the world will do what? Be exactly what? The same. As a matter of fact, we will even support them now because we feel so good about ourselves. Elijah Muhammad then sought to change taste. So when he had you eating that bean pie, you see, it was a different kind of thing. And eating once a day, wearing a different type of clothes, you see. It was just not an imposition of tyranny. That's what the other people would like to tell you. Even though they were tyrannizing you far worse than Elijah Muhammad was doing, if you want to call it that. But what? If we demonize the Europeans, we wean our people from the pursuit of things, what? European. You see? 
if we then create new tastes and tastes for which we can produce, you see, now the person in pursuing their taste will produce for their own nation and economically what? Support the nation. In other words, your money follows your interests. Your money follows your tastes. Your money follows your what? Passions. And one of the major powers that this culture has is to create tastes, passions, and interests in African people. And this is what Eurocentric culture is about. The organizing of African tastes, interests, and passions so that in our pursuit of those interests and passions, in our attempt to satisfy them, we carry the Europeans all of our money and we impoverish ourselves looking for the better life and the better feeling. Therefore, the Europeans have all the products for which they've created a taste in us. And then other immigrants come in and get the products under their control. And we as African people then support and feed all of them while we starve our own children. And consequently, you see, our children have learned often that the only way they can get money out of our pocketbooks is to knock us in the head and take it. That's right. Because we're not gonna get, we're not, they're not going to get it by what? Investing and spending in a planned sort of way and following tastes that have been created within our own culture and our own so forth and so on. Because we have told them that buying things European and pursuing things European and so forth was what it means to be alive and to, to be real and to be free and the whole bit. And yet, it's the pursuit of those very things that has imprisoned us and will maintain us in prison. This is why I've told you many times before that we will f be most enslaved when we feel freest. Yes, we will be most impoverished when we feel wealthy. Because as soon as we get the money, we're going to do what? Take it somewhere else and impoverish ourselves. At the moment we feel free to buy everything we want to, we're going to buy it from whom? Others. And they will use that wealth to maintain our oppression as a people, you see. So this is why we must understand here the relationship between uh, uh, culture and identity. We must understand that culture itself is an instrument of power. Some people criticize Elijah Muhammad for calling Islam black Muslim, a black Islam. But there's a, there's a purpose there. <laughs> It's unorthodox. Islam is not a racist religion. Even though all I see are doggone Arabs hanging up there in North Africa. And I don't see any equal sharing between African Africans and Arab Africans in the heart of Islam. I don't give a hoot what you say about how universal it is. Show it to me in practice. And I don't see it in practice. And you'll learn something very clear. These Europeans and these other groups are going to lay all kind of universal bullshit on your head <laughs> as a way of, of maintaining you in slavery. Yes. In fact, the best way to enslave a Negro is to get him universal. <laughs> yeah. I'm for all people. That means he can't be for himself. He even feels guilty about being for himself. Yeah, you tell him, look, let's act in terms of who we are. Oh, no, no, I'm for all people. Which means I can't commit myself to what? To anyone else. But you see, when other people have already got the scheme set up, it does, what you are for all for doesn't work for all people, though. It seems to always go to what? Particular people. Because I've said, you see, we are absolutists. You see, we believe that if we know the truth and hear the truth, that's the only thing we must believe. And I've told you before, in terms of the Christian theology here, that Africans did not come to America as Christians. I don't care how much you shout and kick over benches. <laughs> you gotta understand that. Your African and our African ancestors did not come to America as what? Christians. And it's 
very important to recognize that. Does that impute Christianity? No, I'm not about attacking Christianity. I'm not at about attacking the reality of Christ or your sincerity. This is not what this is about. You must, though, ask the question, who taught you Christianity? And why did they teach it to you? In other words, you must ask what? Functional questions. How does your teaching me this work for you? And how does it work for me? Even though what I believe you're saying is true and absolutely true, my believing it and your believing the same thing brings about what? Two different consequences. So while the principle you're teaching is universal and absolutely true, given the context in which this is operating, in the context of the fact that you have all the money and you have all the power, my believing this is going to what? Help you to do what? Maintain your money and your power and maintain my weakness. So you can't just fall for an idea simply because it's universal and absolutely true. You've got to look at it within the context in which that idea is being projected. And you've got to look at it in terms of who is believing it. Because the idea will generate effects based on the context in which it operates, not in and of itself. You see? And this is what has happened to black folk who've, who've taken up other religions and had those other people say, you know, you just believe this, and this is true, this is universally true. This has nothing to do with race, and Islam is not a racist religion. That's fine when the Arabs own what? Everything. And that means then that I won't perceive the Arab as, as a race, right? Even though it was just by coincidence, all of his race owns everything, has everything. <laughs> then I'll be made to feel guilty for even thinking in terms of what? My race. Even though my children are, are going hungry, they're robbing me at night, terrorizing the community and the whole bit. It's wrong for me to think of them as race uh, and think in terms of them as a people and so forth because I believe in this universal principle. And yet it is the inequality of wealth and the inequality of power and all kinds of inequalities that are what? Creating the problem. But because I am not allowed to see these inequalities in terms of race, you see, even though when we see the victims of them, the race is quite apparent. <laughs> I cannot transform this situation. You got to be careful with this game, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the kind of game people run on you all the time. You see, whenever people bring you universal truths, whenever they bring you, you know, these great brotherhood ideas, you must ask yourself how believing this is going to function for you. And given your power, and given this or given this, how's it going to function for you, and how's it going to function for me? These fighters went over the world talking about the invisible hand in the laissez-faire economy, you know. Or they come up with some stupidity they're like, we are all God's children, we're all one, we're all human. Nationalism is wrong, we shouldn't uh, discriminate according to border. People should be able to invest wherever they feel like investing, you know. And uh, people should take advantage of opportunities wherever they arise. Now, that sounds so nice and neat, doesn't it? And it is. I have no problem with that. Except, though, you got to move beyond that. you got to look at who's saying it. And if I believe it, what's going to happen? Now, the Europeans said this because they had all the what? The money. You see? So when they convinced our people to believe in free markets and open markets and reject nationalism, we all got children, we all won, and, and therefore all markets should be open for investment no, regardless as to who you invest. The deal is, see, if they had all the money, they're going to end up owning all the land. They're going to end up owning all of the means of production with your consent, with your moral consent, <laughs> you see? And then you're going to wonder if God is cursing you, if something is wrong. You have to understand, then you can't just let people lay an idea on you, a universal concept, a universal religion, and a universal this, and then assume that all is well. You've got to look at reality. So if it's so damn universal, spread that damn money around. <laughs> universal. You believe people should invest wherever they fit? Well, let's first even up the money. And then we, that, then we can invest cross borders and all over the other place. But now you insist on holding on to your money. 
you see, and then, and you believe in what? Private property and all this stuff, and you're going to convince me not to look racially or nationally, and this allows you then to what? Maintain control. And this is the game that we're in. So people say, well, Elijah, you know, you, you're a black Muslim. We, you, we don't believe in blackness. No, 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 ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Jesus said, what? Man, uh, man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for whom? For man. Ultimately, religion is not made just to be served by man, but, but what? The religion must what? Serve man. God is not only to be served. But God also must serve the people. Oh, yeah, I know. You think you never told you should lay all on your face and roll and, and carry on. No way. No way. There is a what? Contract. There is a covenant. It's in your Bible. The Israelites had a what? Covenant between God and themselves. There was an agreement there that what? I do for you and what? You do for me, man. It's not just about laying down, praying, and do whatever you want to the Lord. <laughs> and if you read Moses, and if you read it, you will see going on between Moses and God, constant what? Negotiation. In fact, that's what you find, I find so fascinating about reading the Exodus story. Hey, this man sits down and negotiates. You remember that time? Uh, they get near the border and they start hollering and screaming, talking about they were better off than slavery. And they wanted to go back to Egypt, and they, you know, they were about to hang Moses. They was within an inch of hanging Moses. You know, Moses never got hung several times. You know, a lot of people don't read this thing very well at all. He was not seen as some holy man with a halo above him. These people didn't see Moses that way at all. They got at him. They got so out of hand until God said, let me just strike these people with a thunderbolt and wipe them from the face of the earth. Yeah. And then Moses started doing what? Negotiating with them. And even reminded God, what? Hey, wait a minute now. Remember, you bought them out here on the promise, right? <laughs> yeah. And you said that you had a what? Promised land for them and so forth and so forth and this for them. How are you going to look if all of a sudden you get out here and destroy these people and go in a sense against your word? Oh, yeah, you're right, Moses. <laughs> yeah, I did say that. Read it. You don't have to believe me as your preacher tell you. Read the Bible. It's right there. There was a negotiation there. What? There's a service between the two things, not just one way street. And so in black Muslims, in the black nation of Islam, Islam is used also to do what? Serve black folk. You must understand that. As soon as you remove the blackness from it, and blackness has no relevance to it, it loses its capacity to serve our interest. And more often than not, it will serve the interests of Arabs and serve the interests of other people because it will not change the pre-existing social economic power relationship, you see. And you have to understand that. Elijah understood it very well, you see. So no, no, no. We're going to make it black because we want it to what? Serve black. A racial identity, an ethnic identity, is not a mere way of identifying yourself by a word or a label. It is not, mere, it is not a mere designation of ethnic characteristics, nor just a designation of people who make... Uh, uh, look alike to some degree or share a similar area or share, uh, share a particular area. Ultimately, an ethnic identity is a prescription for behaving, for relating to each other in a particular way, for seeing yourself and seeing each other and seeing the world and relating to God and relating to nature and to relating to everything else in the world so that it operates in the interest of the group. That's right. Must understand that. In the racial de uh, designation or identity is a prescription for action, is a prescription for relating. And in the nation of Islam, when it was black Islam, 
It means blacks who were Muslims would relate to other blacks in a particular sort of way so that it would benefit blacks who were Muslims. And that's the result of it. Changing their taste, changing the diet, changing the values, and so forth. And what do you mean there then? Since the taste changed, the money that flowed out of the nation of Islam, pursuing the taste created by other people, did what? Flowed back in. Flowed back in. And it means then that money created what we call an accumulation of capital within the nation. It created, in many ways, a savings on the part of the people. Because the two, three, four thousand dollars that they would spend buying junk and garbage and other kind of crap now was saved, and that saving now could be used to be invested in businesses, to be invested in schools, could be invested in education, and the other kinds of things they needed to do for themselves. And that accumulation of wealth I was also an investment in power in a society where wealth and power are often correlated. Am I getting through? I know you're getting a little rest. I'm going to let you go in a minute. Let you go in a minute. You see, we have to understand what went on here. I create your taste for beans. I create your taste for this. And because I do, I'm going to make the pie for you, right? We make the pie what? For ourselves. So now you eat the pie, but now, and you spend the money, and that goes back, and we can buy what? Farms. And now we can do what? Grow the beans. You see, we can create the what? Canneries. We can now build a what? A whole system of production based on the reorganization of taste and the reorganization of interest, you see. This is what African-centered education is about, ladies and gentlemen. It's not merely about the teaching of African culture or of African history. That's only a part of it. It is about the transformation of the personality, the transformation of social relations among African people. Ultimately, it is about economic and political development. Ultimately, it is about power. Ultimately, it is about freeing the black mind to move in the world, to be powerful in the world, you see to produce for self and to enhance African wealth and to enhance the African status in the world. This is what it's about, and it's deeper even than this.